This is the worst public health crisis for a generation. A quarter of the world's population is now under lockdown. 195 million jobs to go. The COVID pandemic has cost lives. It caused a massive shock to the country's economy and we're going to be living with it for some time. It's very clear that rates are still going up. We don't have this under control at the moment. So how do we keep the disease under control and support a sustained economic recovery? Economists and public health specialists have rarely worked together in the past. Economists are focused on building a successful economy and public health specialists on improving our health. They have different models and approaches, sometimes incompatible. But during this crisis, it's understood by leading government advisors that we need an approach that combines the best of economics and the best of public health. I think what we now need to think about is what would we do to try to take advantage of what we've learned and integrate both science and economics as combined evidence information for policy and decision making. And I think that is something that is really worth going after as a goal. That's where economics meets epidemiology. I'm Tim Besley from the LSE, and I've been talking to colleagues from across the country, and I'm keen to know how advisors and academics have been working together to provide solutions that both support the economy and save lives. I think it's fairly clear that um, the people, the government was thinking about this in health terms. And to be honest, it was the triumph of politics. As you can imagine, the, the biggest political problem for the prime minister and the government, as they saw it, was the NHS being overrun. This is what they kept on about. This is what all of the press conferences, you know, say the NHS save lives. Protect the NHS. The idea of television pictures of people on trolleys outside hospitals, running out of ventilator space, all of that sort of thing was what it was all about. So it was the direct, the visible, the politically will be blamed for this. I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. The government was emphatic about the need to lock down the economy to combat COVID-19. This had severe economic consequences and in particular hit many of the disadvantaged groups in society hard. The national debt has risen to more than two trillion. GDP fell by some estimates as much as 20% and around nine million workers were claiming from the government's furlough program. That's when we needed the economists, the social scientists, more generally the educational specialists in the room to say, well, you know, what, what are the costs and benefits of these different things? Thank you very much. As we transition from the rescue to the recovery phase, it's essential to think about both long-term and short-term implications of what we've done. It's not a question of lives or livelihoods, it's taking both into consideration when we design policy. Is there a, a trade-off, as you see it, between paying attention to public health issues and worrying about the economy? If we reflect on the countries across the world over the past six months, what we've seen is the countries that have controlled the virus well, South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, Norway, Denmark, have generally done better, both in terms of their deaths per capita, as well as their um, economic performance. The notion of a trade-off is not correct and very often these things are pulling in the same direction and sometimes there are some obvious different directions that these get pulled in and I think what we tried to do from the beginning is to ask the question where do the potential harms come from and they come from direct Covid harm, they come from indirect harm because the health system is in some way compromised and therefore other health risks get affected and they come from potential long-term harms from economic damage. So back in March we didn't really have the tools to bring epidemiology and economics together but there have been huge advances since and now it's understood at the highest level that we have to bring the data and the modelling tools together to have a real impact on policy. You must have had some idea in mind that somehow science and economics could work together. 
we saw this as a, a multi-dimensional problem. There was the clinical problem of uh, the actual infection, the disease, uh, how to treat it. Then there was the public health problem, which is how do you prevent transmission and how do you treat it at a population level. And then we also realized that it, since this has a huge effect on the economy, that we would need economists uh, to think about how to uh, minimize the economic damage. Get all the disciplines in there. I think when people talk about following the science, I think the mistake there is no, follow the sciences, make it plural. And that's not just medical, but social sciences as well. But getting the balance right is tricky. If we open up the economy too quickly, the disease starts to progress again. If we do it too slowly, that imposes unnecessary costs on people's lives. The role of the models is to give us an insight into that. So what exactly do we do in this work? Well, standard epidemiological models are explicitly non-behavioral. So what that means is that they don't really take into account all these spontaneous behavioral changes by workers, by individuals and households in the population. But what we've seen is that people do react to changes in infection risk. We need to model that in order to better understand the spread of the virus more broadly. This is a dynamic model that can be used to, to track uh, the dynamics of the economy on the one hand, but also the dynamics of the epidemic on the other hand, and also to make predictions about its future evolution and predictions about its evolution under alternative policy options. Uh, and we've used those type of dynamic uh, integrated models would then also feature, importantly, uh, these distributional considerations. Where modeling is useful is once you understand the parameters involved, and then you want to change things or impose certain restrictions, you can model what would happen if you introduce this measure, or if you introduce that measure. What would be the effect of vaccination if it was 30% effective versus 60% effective. But of course, as any scientist could tell you, models are only useful if they're combined with the right kind of data. One of the big, big lessons from this is we've got to get data and data systems right, because absent that, you are trying to fight things in, in, in the dark. If we're not careful, what we do is bring together a series of incomplete data sets with uncertainty in them and instead of getting to more potential certainty and ability to make decisions we just amplify uncertainty. We're working at the cutting edge of the most important issue facing the country but it's essential that we translate the lessons of theory into reality and the models are useful at telling us about how policy can be targeted both geographically and to particular kinds of economic activity. What we want is workers to feel safe enough to go out um, and work and expose themselves potentially to catching the virus. And we also want sick workers to feel secure enough to stay at home and not feel the, the pressure to go out and work if they are ill. Statutory sick pay and more generous statutory sick pay can play a big role in this. A policy that could have a positive effect in terms of alleviating this trade-off between lives and livelihoods and that comes out of our models is rather than shutting down entire sectors, you use tax policy to encourage or discourage specific economic activity. As an example, rather than shutting down the entire restaurant industry, uh, you could imagine just putting a tax on restaurant visits. So obviously restaurants wouldn't like such a tax, but they would like it better, I would think, than completely shutting down the entire uh, restaurant industry. What are the kind of targeted measures you need? Is it targeted furlough? Are there grants? Are there loans? And working through, actually, if we want to control the virus, there's a lot we can release in the economy and get back to normal, and there's other restrictions we need to put in place. With a crisis like this, there's an opportunity for renewal, for reflection and scientific innovation. There's lots of new research out there, but for it to achieve its potential, it has to influence policymaking. If that happens, there are enormous benefits.
I'll leave you with a final thought from Gus O'Donnell. And the one thing I can guarantee is we'll be really good at this the next time it comes along. We will have learned lots of lessons. But of course, we need answers now. And that's why economists worldwide are working to understand the links between economics and epidemiology so that we can do our very best to navigate through the immediate challenges that we face.